Okay, by 11. In 18.1, I went over Linnaean classification, binomial nomenclature, and introduced you to uh, King Philip came over for good soup, kingdom, phylum, class, order, family, genus, species. The way we organize things on the planet. Um, now, there's a little bit more to that, as it turns out, but we'll lift the veil on all these little biological secrets as we go along. In 18.2, um, what our job will be there is we have to tell you not only how we classify things based on how similar we think they look. Right? It might be pretty obvious to classify dogs and bears as being, you know, what's somewhat closely related, evolutionarily related, you might think. But we have other tricks up our sleeve. There's other things we have to pay attention to. And if we do it right, and it's a cost, uh, constant uh, process of analyzing, fixing, and revising, and making sure we've got the, the whole giant catalog of life, uh, which you might have heard called the tree of life, correct? Um, there's other things we can look at now, and important things you might have heard. Analyzing DNA, um, checking to see what kind of characteristics that two closely related critters might have in common. Maybe they've got a common mutation that's the same. Um, there's these little evolutionary Sherlock Holmes kind of clues that you have to pay attention to. So I want to introduce you to these in 18.2. And we'll get going here. So, iPad, let's get going with the mirroring here. And that's really what I'm doing when I do these slideshows. Um, I'm screen capturing um, an iPad mirroring session. Sounds technical. I'm just using my iPad with a headset and it's recording what I'm doing, including all my scribbling and babbling. So, 18.2, Modern Evolutionary Classification. So what do we have here? We're looking at sort of the tree of life and we're looking to see how closely related are these critters. We've got a crab and a barnacle. Barnacles, you might have, you might know them. You, you see them attached to the bottom of ships, right? And um, to rocks and things like that. And there's a little sort of shelled organism called a limpet. You might have heard of it. Now, I'm going to focus in on this. I call this at first glance, and there's nothing wrong with this, but you're going to see where we made a mistake here. If you look at these at first, you'd say at first glance, I think that these two are more closely related, these two here. The barnacle and limpet, well look at that shell, you know it's kind of a cone shaped shell, and um, if you don't know what barnacles really are, you, you, if you look really carefully at this this stuff here in the, uh, oops, I have to bring up, I'm going to bring this up. It's a filter feeder, and you see these sort of these little feathery extensions here. I'll undo that, but I just wanted to draw attention to what that is. It's a little critter inside of a home, and you'd be surprised at what's really in there. It's not quite what you think. A lot of people think they're like shellfish or something. No, that's not what we're looking at with a barnacle. Good thing you're in a biology class. A limpet, oops, is a little bit more of what you'd expect to be sort of a shelled organism, right? Something a little bit more clam-like, right? People can often be deceived um, by assumptions that they make. Not deceived, but they just, you make an incorrect assumption. Because you say, well, that crab on the left has appendages like arms, and those two things on the right there, they're shelled. So when this sort of, when it was first classified, they made a mistake. And they said, I'm going to change colors because I'm going to choose something cool. Let's go with, well, I had purple. Can't do that. Let's go, since that's red, let's go with this kind of annoying green. They thought that at some point as the ancestor was developing and um, evolving that we sort of had a fork in the road because let's face it these guys have exoskeletons right so they kind of all have something in common right they've got a hard outer covering that's protecting them 
However, something with a hard outer protective shell got legs, right? All these legs. There's 10 of them there. That's a decapod, just in case you were wondering. And these guys over on the right did not. Okay, so they're, they're very different. At, that's kind of the, how the thinking goes. So we think that there was a split. This guy went his way. And that these were different. They're kind of a different experiment in life, if you think of it. And then at this point, these guys split off some common ancestor, uh, usually an older ancestor, um, kind of gave rise to two forms, if you want to think of it that way. Turns out that this is wrong, that these, this fork in the road that you see here, this is not correct. In fact, these two aren't as youthfully related because this would be more recent, right? This happened more recently and this happened right here, this fork in the road, would have happened um, long ago. Because it took time for the critters to change. Well, turns out this isn't the correct evolutionary relationship. When the studies were done and we looked at more carefully at the characteristics of the organisms, we found some neat things. It's the characteristics that help us figure out the tree of life. When we look at what they all have in common, if these three critters all have something in common, then their ancestors would have had it in common. Because as you can tell, they're really different. So common characteristics are usually quite old. And we'll draw attention to this. These guys all have this weird little swimming sort of uh, it's a free swimming larva and it it basically doesn't grow into the adult form until it uh, swims away finds a safe place to develop not get eaten right and it's sort of worm like so we'll draw a little oops undo Let's see if i can zoom in on them a little bit this little worm like larva so since they all have it then that's considered to be an old characteristic, common, old. So we start to look at what they don't have in common. Well, it turns out, we start going through their characteristics, that these two, the crab and the barnacle, they're both segmented. It's a little bit harder to, harder to see in the barnacle. Inside of a barnacle, Let's jump out to safety of the internet. Let's go to a barnacle. Let's show you what's in there. Now you see them on the sides of ships, but this is what I really wanted to show you. Nice little diagram of it. There is a little feeding organism. It's a little sort of, It's you can think of it as almost like a tiny shrimp on his back. And um, it's not quite right, but it'll give you the idea. He's on his back, and what he's doing is he's kind of got his legs stuck up in the air, and he's grabbing food and bringing it down to his mouth, which you can see laid um, basically in that sort of yellow section there. So a barnacle is not what you thought. Okay, It is a little bit more related to shrimp and crabs and things in that than you ever would have imagined but you couldn't see through the shell hmm. all the things you discover in a biology class eh? so now that we know what's in there it's kind of like this shrimp like thing on its back I guess if you wanted to do a rough comparison so we know that it's segmented think of shrimp for example they have body segments little pieces of their body and the crab well you can see the segmentation in its limbs well, interestingly enough, there we go, we'll let that render. If these guys share segmentation, the barnacle and the crab, they're more related. 
that's that's a more modern thing so these two the crab and the barnacle must have diverged off at a later date the limpet doesn't have any degree of segmentation in its body the, the shell doesn't count when we actually look at the, the the organism that's inside that shell it's not segmented so it's not like the others it's older what we're looking at here are characteristics and as new characteristics show up um, what well, we call them derived characteristics these are evolutionary characteristics that we compare to see if two things have uh, a degree of relation let's push this a little further so sure the barnacle and the crab are segmented okay however we'll go we'll look at another characteristic that shows that they're fairly um, they're fairly similar when bugs get too big for their outer skeleton their exoskeleton they have to molt it okay you've seen this come up with um, a famous one is an arachnid one where the arachnid as it grows it gets too big and then it sheds its tough outer shell and then it has to sort of hide because it's soft for a while having an exoskeleton okay external skeleton let's call it an exoskeleton because that's really what it is these two have it in common so not only do they have segmentation but they have an exoskeleton that they shed every once in a while that makes me quite sure that these two are related so what we're looking at and let's nail this because we don't want to get this wrong when we're looking at these characteristics we look at when they're derived like when they show up and that tells us how to arrange uh, more accurately the little um, little journeys on the tree of life because if we had done this this way we would have swung the tree of life to the right and we would have totally gotten it wrong and if we pay attention to not just similarities but we take a look at their characteristics and things they have in common the the things you the fewer things you have in common right um, the more distantly related you are but when you look at characteristics that you do have in common with other critters you must be pretty closely related here's a way of thinking about it look at how much you have in common with your own family members characteristics you have in uh, the humans have in, with each other um, there's a lot of them and it kind of says you know we're definitely on the same branch of the evolutionary tree so these derived characteristics are important they help us to do, to do what's called a cladogram, which is a tree of life, which is set up in a more correct way. So those derived characteristics are those little dots. They are the characteristics that we compare to help us draw a cladogram. It's a more evolutionary accurate way of figuring out the tree of life look at what's in common look at what things don't have in common don't just look at what they look like it takes more work but it's good science okay then you get this what the heck is this okay what you've got is the tree of life and we're looking at sort of the center and how things have radiated outwards and how you form this great branching tree so this looks really weird when it's drawn this way but they've they're sort of wrapping it in a circle and this is really hard to understand I'm a little happier with something like this where you look at the tree of life and you say what came from what so uh, you know that a domestic dog is fairly young so I'll, I'll do you a favor and say that down here at the bottom something like a fox come here you is a really old dog like form and something like a fox fox like form how do we know it's an old form because we find their fossils and those are old fossils and then a little later on little evolution of the body form 
So changing conditions, changing times. When we look in the fossil record, we find things that are wolf-like and things that are fox-like. We find the wolf and the fox. Well, imagine that. And then if we look a little bit later on in the fossil table, we say, well, what kind of dog-like forms are showing up later? Jackals, the African wild dog. Ooh, coyotes are younger than wolves. It's kind of a new, slicker form, right? And it's not that wolves went extinct. It's just that through, uh, through evolution, you get new forms. Uh, I guess a way of an analogy I would say is we've had cars for a very long time. There's newer types of cars and there's older types of cars. Some cars go extinct. Some are still around. So just because there's new ones, don't it doesn't mean the old ones are gone. But over time, yes, there are more extinction events. So our wolves get some little bit of diversity with the wolves. And we think that the closest thing to our dog, and mine sitting here beside me wondering why I'm talking to myself in the basement when I'm teaching you, you get the domestic dog, something like Canis familiaris right here. And um, you could almost say humans have co-evolved with a domestic dog. We have a very close relationship. And my dog's telling me to hurry up and finish this lecture so he can get a snack. There, oh, his ears went up. Okay, back to the lecture. So biologists um, group organisms into categories that, and let's, I'm going to, I'll highlight this. They're lines of evolutionary descent. And that's what cladograms do. Not, 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 not just physical similarities. Okay? So the cladogram that was looking at the how the characteristics were derived, how young and how old they were, cladograms are awesome because they give us a much more accurate idea of what's going on. So, yay, cladogram. And that gives us not just classification, because if we did classification, but we weren't paying attention to when characteristics evolved, we would have some pretty weird associations. We would have gotten the last one wrong. The name of the game is to get evolutionary classification. We want the tree of life to follow when things showed up on our planet and how well related they are. Then it's actually a tree of life that makes sense, right? Not just one of where things look the same. We totally get it wrong. Okay, so the higher level of the taxon, the further back in time the ancestor goes. Okay, so as we go back, think of this as going back through the evolution of the dog. We're going back to an ancestor, right? that's raised basically here. So we're going from, let's say, from the specific to the more general, the older. Okay, recent. Oh, that's not going to work. Things that are recent and things that are a lot older here. So the wolf form, you might think, it has been around forever. But it's actually our friend the fox, LOL, that is the champ. It's been around the longest. Alrighty, so here we go. This uh, just goes back to the first slide we were looking at, saying, okay, this is the way you want to do it if you want to get it wrong, and this is the way you do it if you want to do this correct. Now, you can challenge me on that, try to stuff me and say, how do you know that's correct? How are you sure? Well, we say, well, the cladogram, when we look at their characteristics, scientifically, this makes sense. Younger characteristics are shared. Look at the coyote and the wolf at how close their body forms are. Look at how many things they have in common. And they're fairly, they're fairly youthfully um, related. Right? They've been around for a shorter period of time than say, oh, the fox. So it's it's a piece of the puzzle. It's not the entire puzzle. But what will blow you away is if we grab 
the DNA of something like a wolf and a coyote and we start to see a lot of genes start to overlap like wow they got a lot of genes in common maybe that cladogram stuff was actually right turns out yes it is so if you're good at using these recent and older characteristics to set up the tree of life you could say that you're making cladograms it's a fun thing to do at parties and you could say as you're analyzing how things are related I gotta get off this pen color it's driving me crazy let's go with like really annoying green but just not too annoying let's choose that you could say that what you're doing is a cladistic analysis to see how two organisms are related picture picture yourself as a graduate student in biology hunting down this information you'd be looking at not just how similar things are but when their characteristics were derived and everybody gets hung up on that word derived and it means when they show up when the characteristic Oh, come on, pen. Appeared. You in the fossil record, for example, you don't see it all the time. Right? The opposable thumb is definitely a derived characteristic that hominids have. And I don't know about you, but that's not something my dog over there has. Okay? I'm not as closely related to him. Although he thinks he's a family member. Right? Derived characteristics. When the characteristic appeared. Was that recently? which means we're highly related, or was it longer ago? Which means we're more distantly related. But you don't just look at one characteristic. You look at a whole bunch of them. Make sure that there's not something you're missing. Okay, so derived characteristics. We can set up whole evolutionary trees based on this. Here's a neat one. Let's look at how animals are related. And if we go to something like new color blue is driving me nuts do, 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 let's go with orange okay all these critters here they all have vertebrae right or a cord up their backs that's that's an older characteristic they all have vertebrae so that must have showed up in evolution a long time ago the bony skeleton hmm, shark doesn't have that so the invention of the bony skeleton must be more youthful so fish amphibians primates all these guys here it's much more recently related okay Ooh, redo and four limbs okay you can see as we go up the tree as we go up the tree we're getting to more youthful derived characteristics which gives us an idea at this point what is more related to what for example look at hair well that pretty well has to do with these critters right here and crocodiles and birds well when we look at we tend to look at their skulls uh, we could see some really interesting sort of pattern in the holes in the skulls or whether they have holes at all so just using derived characteristics we get an idea of how things are related look over here I'm gonna speed up my dog's puffing at me I think he wants out we can look at the evolution of um, let's see here grab a color doo, doo, doo. we can look at um, well here here's the invention of the egg right that's fairly new right definitely it, the amniotic egg shows up in birds and in reptiles mammary glands well, horses and dogs have these, right? Those are milk-producing glands, right? So they're in these two here, but not... They're in these two, but they're not in any of these. So that is a more youthful-derived characteristic. You get the idea, right? I like, I like the diagram on the left better than the one on the right. I think it just fits me better. Okay, so if we haven't beaten you to death with this topic yet, you will know this. Derived characteristics show us 
the relationships. Okay? Those free swimming larvae, hey, because they all have it, it's got to be an old feature. But that skeleton and that molting and segmentation, that's a big deal. That's that's younger. So I want to jump past that because I think I've hit that, killed it. Now, there's also similarities in your genetic code. So by your genetic code, you're aware of this one called DNA. Okay. But there's an older version of the genetic code. Um, some viruses are using this called RNA. Now, DNA is deoxyribonucleic acid, and RNA is ribonucleic acid, the not deoxy version, right here. Now, we can analyze this. You, you have RNA in your body. It's, it's not something that you use for your genetic code. Um, it's just a little bit older. Some things on the planet still use as your genetic code. We still need it, right? But uh, you want to know more about these two, come see me in in grade 12. We'll go over it. It's actually a huge topic. But the, when we look at the genes of organisms, right, um, stretches of DNA, we can see similarities right down at uh, the molecular level. And we start to look at well, what are the chances that two organisms could have this much DNA in common? Okay, it, this happens with brothers and sisters and mums and dad. We have tremendous amounts of DNA in common. Right? Um, humans have tremendous number of genes in common. The more closely related you are, the more you would have in common. I'm just saying that. If you've watched CSI, they talk about, what is it, four allylic markers in common in your, your siblings. Four super unique uh, regions of DNA is what they're talking about. But your genes are like a fingerprint. And boy, if those fingerprints turn out to be really, really the same, holy smokes, you know that two things are highly related. And let's look at the other extreme. If you put my DNA out there and compare it to a starfish's DNA, holy smokes, it's going to be different. It'll go even further. Take my DNA out there and compare it to something like a bacteria's DNA. Hugely different because we're so distantly related from each other. So DNA turns out to be a huge, huge help in classification and figuring out what's related to what. Of course, right? We've got the CSI like ability. Let's go for it. Here's a neat stretch on your slideshow. It's going to look really small, so I'm going to zoom in on it. Let's say we're looking at two species, right? We're going to compare their DNA, and we want to look at these critters. Now it turns out these are, you got to look at the fine print, right? Gene fragments of sheep and European deer. Okay, it, it, I'm not really worried about which is which because we've got these horrible scientific names, right? They've kind of given you a little bit of an indicator here. But let's put their gene sequences together. And if you haven't seen DNA before, it's essentially, let's grab a pen here. There's four letters that you will, that you'll see in DNA in different patterns, A, G, C, and T. Okay. It's a four letter alphabet folks. And it codes for everything that is the blueprint. That's you. Now look at these sequences. Okay. So let's, uh, it looks like we're looking at their X and Y chromosomes, their, their sex chromosomes. And as we let the computer sequence out the DNA, right, we notice, wow, it's the same. Look at this. Look at this gene sequence right here. Let's go further down, further downstream in the DNA. Well, that's like exactly the same. They got a lot of stuff that's the same. Okay, there's some tracks here where they're just saying it's the same, it's the same, it's the same. Some regions of differences, but I'm pretty struck by how much overlaps. Incredible overlap. Just look at those right there. So 
if we go back and we think about what we were comparing, we were comparing sheep to deer. Wait a minute, those are both mammals. They're both herbivores. They're both, uh, they both have a placenta, which helps their babies to develop internally. Wait a minute, wait a minute. They should have a lot of DNA in common, right? They're pretty closely related kind of herbivores. Not exactly having everything in common, but quite a bit. Uh, humans, for example, and mice, mice have 90% of the genes in common with us. Shockingly enough, if, if not so shocking, you look at a chimpanzee and you'll see that that total goes to the high 90s for um, genetic overlap. But isn't it amazing? As similar as we are genetically to something like a chimpanzee or, or an orangutan, we're still different. You can see what those small changes in DNA mean. Okay, so tracking the DNA is a great way of determining if you've got similarities. And then there's mutations. Now, I think everybody saw X-Men and lost their mind. We're not talking about, uh, what was it, the X gene, which gives you superpowers. Okay, no, 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 no. we got to come back down to reality. As our DNA changes, you can think of the DNA molecule as being set to a clock over time. And there are chance mutations to DNA. When your DNA is copied, when your cells are dividing, sometimes it gets copied a little bit wrong and that can lead to a mutation. So that's kind of unique, right? If it, imagine if uh, let's, you're copying something out and you spell a word wrong in your own kind of unique way. And it's kind of interesting what you left behind, right? Let's say that's a copy of a book, for example. That mistake is going to be fairly unique, right? That's your mistake. That's a unique one. Well, those unique mutations, right, changes to stretches of genes can have some pretty interesting effects. They le they're basically like a, well, kind of like a calling card. And they, make, they can make two organisms pretty different. Look at this mutation. Here's, here's an ancestral species. And as it was happily existing and as, you know, the population was moving on, this side over here, underwent two mutations to, let's say, genes. But what has happened in those mutations is you've got this mutation here in this stretch and one here. So, okay, mutations happen all the time. They're, they're, most of them are, are just silent mutations. They're no big deal. Um, and then there are mutations that turn out to be pretty big deal, right? Um, when you look at the snowshoe hair, it's got a pretty interesting mutation turn white in the middle of winter, doesn't it? Yeah, that one turned out to be good, helped it survive. When we look at these two mutations on this side, there are two different uh, regions on the uh, genetic code. So it's totally different, right? These are like markers. And as these critters go and have babies, they're genes will kind of get passed on. We can follow these markers and see just how long, just what sort of is being going on, right? How long has it been since that mutation was passed on? Because that marker, those mutations, if you will, um, well, more mutations will begin to happen. And these mutations, over time, real like changes in the genetic sequence can make two organisms really different. If you don't believe me, there's this little, well, it's kind of an island. It's kind of big, South Pacific. Um, they like to surf there. It's called Australia. Um, and down in Australia, if you look at the animals that are mammal-like, you know, the kangaroos, and uh, you look at the dingo, their mammals can't breed with the mammals that are on our continent. Now this, if you've ever heard of continental drift, Australia kind of floated away and did its own thing. The mutations and the, that happen because of the DNA copying that goes on inside of our bodies all the time, well, the mutations that were going on in Australia were, they were happening with that population. That population was doing its own thing. So it's, it's, muta it's been undergoing its own sort of evolutionary experiment. 
but let's say if these were like the Australian ones, well, they're after a while, they're going to end up being pretty different. But when we look back, we can still see, hey, look at that. There's that mutation. It's like a marker. And there's that mutation. Hmm. They're kind of like derived characteristics, don't you think? Right? They're older. These are old mutations. Okay. So you follow the mutations backwards, and you can figure out what's younger and what's older. This species over here, well, it's it doesn't have any of these mutations in common with this group over here. Man, this guy must be a lot older. And these two must be younger and more closely related. Interesting. So we're still looking for what they kind of have in common, but this time we're tracking their mutations. Wow, that's deep. Okay, that, ladies and gentlemen, is by tracking their molecular mutations over time, we call that a molecular clock. Okay, interesting concept. Um, it's, it's a challenging one, but you get the idea. It's just derived characteristics following mutations. All right, so by my clock, it's 12.08. So I'm going to check out, and I hope that you had a chance to go through the course site um, because uh, the videos the YouTube animations, everything that's there um, is for your benefit. And if you see something that says like quiz preparation, here's a big hint. Check it out. And um, be sure to check me out on Twitter as well. Um, current hashtag is biology11, um, hashtag CHSS. Okay. We will see you out there tomorrow.